How's it going there guys? In this video I'm going to be pitting these two smart telescopes head to head against one another on the same night on the same target using their inbuilt dual band filters. I tried to take an image of the SADA region of space, the butterfly nebula actually, as it happens. And I wanted to see what the end user experience for these two smart telescopes is like in a up-to-date fashion. So it's been a while since they're both released, not that long, they're relatively new devices but in the short time that they have been out there's been numerous improvements to the software and features available to both of these so in order to perform this test i of course set them up as i mentioned at the same time uh, both were running in equatorial mode and i took the time to get a an app reported at least perfect polar alignment now the polar alignment on both of these is a little bit coarse but it does the job However, I do have some problems to report in terms of both of them. So both telescopes are now capable of 60 second exposures, though the usability of those 60 second exposures is not just a surefire thing. It's a little bit hit or miss for me. Indeed, for this particular experiment on the Seastar S30, I ended up having to use 20 second exposures in order to get a good hit rate like a keep rate, if you will, rather, of the data that's coming in. The Dwarf, I managed 30 second exposures on the same night. Neither really could comfortably manage 60 second subs, unfortunately. But on different targets, they were fine. So uh, it's worth more investigation. But as we're trying to focus on one region, I'll uh, just talk about that for now. Uh, one final thing before I, you know, stop looking crazy, hanging on to these two, <laughs> talking to the camera. Uh, the app experience overall has matured greatly on the Dwarf. I have to say they're adding a lot of new features to it and it's it's continually improving, I have to say, and it's not difficult to navigate and get set up anymore. That said, it's definitely fair to say that the Seastar overall, its app is better and it's a little bit more intuitive. Um, if I was going to advise, you know, a, an absolute beginner, which one of these to pick based on the app experience, it would be the Seastar. There's a lot more to talk about, so I'm going to go ahead and put these down now and start taking you through the data. Now, talking about the data on these two smart telescopes, I've got various different stacks to talk about from this, but uh, I'm going to talk to you about what it actually looks like right out of the box. So the Dwarf will provide you with a denoised, stacked and stretched version as part of the course once you've finished your, your stack, and that looks like this. It looks a little bit soft. The denoising that it uses is a bit strong. But it also provides you with a stacked up TIFF, um, which is ready to use, or rather a FIT, should I say. Ready to use, completely unstretched. So this is linear. If I just undo the STF there, you can see this is unstretched data, just with an auto stretch applied for visibility uh, through ASI FITS viewer. Now, in terms of the subs coming in from the Dwarf, we're still focusing just on the Dwarf at the minute. What you will note is there's less to see in each individual sub, so I think the inbuilt dual band filter is a little bit less narrow, but you'll notice a slight amount of drift, and then every sixth sub exposure, in terms of these 30 second subs, actually dithers, so it makes a, uh, a calculated move, if you like, a small random movement, in order to make sure that hot pixels and things like that are displaced against one another once stacking takes place. It's really, it's a smart thing for them to have included. And it's good to see that it is now part of the Dwarf's routine. Uh, now going over to the C star data and what that actually looks like. So the butterfly subs, as I mentioned, I had to use 20 second subs in order to get a good kind of keep rate on these things. The, the C star rather did this every five sub exposures. And you can see that tracking on the night was a little bit better probably overall uh, on average for the sea star but again it was a little bit hit or miss but these individual per sub changes are minimal and then we go on to the dithers which you can see are those displacements those happen without interrupting your stack now the the sea star also outputs stacks for you to use of course this is the the base output before any noise reduction you can also make a noise reduced output two from the c-star but you have to go into its edit mode in order to do that otherwise you'll just be left with this view and it also does provide a stacked unstretched uh fit in order to work with so as you can see if i just turn off the auto stretch right there it is indeed linear data that you can then work with it's a good thing to see because it wasn't always the case especially on the dwarf it used to actually stretch your subs for you a little bit which wasn't ideal 
Now, if you take a look at the stacks side by side before we apply any processing to them, you can note some differences between these two smart telescopes right away. So we're looking at the C star S30 on the left in all cases and the dwarf over on the right. And you'll note the orientation of the sensor on these two is different. So the dwarf is a larger field of view, even though both of these telescopes are 150 millimeter focal length. It's a larger field of view. It's also got a slightly finer sampling ratio because it uses a smaller pixel pitch camera, 2 micron pixels as opposed to 2.9 micron pixels over on the left. Uh, and you can see that one is landscape and one is portrait, if you like, aligned, uh, aligned horizontally or vertically. Now, if we zoom in a, a little bit and take a look up close at a one-to-one -one view on both of these, let's just uh, bring those in. You can see obviously that sampling ratio difference means that the asterisms within these shots look uh, vastly different in scale. In fact, in order to kind of make them match, I probably need to bring the dwarf up to two to one and the C star to three to one to get them kind of close. If I just overlay these two, you can see the, the stars are just about overlapping. So that's what we'll do just for the sake of this kind of side by side comparison. But bear in mind that's going to make the noise profile on the C star look very slightly worse. In both of these cases, we're dealing with about 55 minutes of data before the clouds start to roll in, unfortunately. Now, overall, the star shapes in the center that we're looking at right here are good on both. The dwarf is showing a bit of dispersion going down. Um, it's not so much like a comatic appearance, but it, it, there's something off about the appearance of the stars right there that's not apparent in the C star S30. But I will say I think that the overall field performance is better on the dwarf. So if we take a look, let's say, for example, at the top left on the C star data, you can see that we're getting like a lot of elongation on these things, a bit of an undercorrected field curvature or something going on right there. And it's leading to these stars having like a, a, a long comet appearance, you know what I mean? Whereas on the dwarf, the stars are still pretty down round in the corner right there. If we just follow the image around, so we'll go bottom left now on the C star, bottom left on the dwarf. You can see the dwarf is about the same in the corner as it was in the center. Still seeing that radially um, apparent aberration on the C star image right there. Bottom right versus bottom right. You can see once again, there's that dispersion on the, on the dwarf. But overall field performance, top right is the best corner on my particular sample of the C star S30. So in terms of, you know, coverage and illumination, I, I actually think that both are well illuminated. You can now take flat frames. However, if you do get dust spots and things like that on your C-star images on the Dwarf, I do not believe that that's yet a possibility, or at least I couldn't find the opportunity to do that within the app. So you have to deal with gradients as they come. These can be managed, of course, after the fact, if you're going to take these images and process them further on a PC, like I'm talking about doing right here. But uh, I just want you to let you know that ahead of time, you can't really take flats with this one, but you can with the C-Star and it's a very easy process on the C-Star, I will say that. Overall, in terms of detail available, um, it's pretty much a tie. I think possibly the center field performance might be a touch better. In fact, it is a touch better on the C-Star S30, but there isn't that much between them. But the overall field performance is probably better on the uh, Dwarf. So now if we move these along into next, the next steps of processing, basically, um, and apply Blur Exterminator to both. So I'll just pick a, a region again. If Let's say we zoom back into this core part um, and match them up side by side once more. So this is about the same sort of field of view. You can see before we apply BXT in both cases, uh, I'm going to apply it now to the C-Star. Really tightens things up. And now onto the Dwarf. That dispersion is really cleaned up and so too are the star kind of profiles overall it probably works a little bit better on the dwarf data i have to say uh, due to that slightly finer sampling ratio but it works really well in both cases and you'll note it does completely fix those uh, those bad corner stars that we were obviously paying attention to earlier if you just see the before and after on the uh, the sea star the dwarf didn't have as much work to do uh, in that regard but uh, there you go blue exterminate fixes both go now and apply 
noise exterminator so i'll just take these along another couple steps and uh re stf them we are going to take a look at these when they're in a more com complete process state but this is kind of what you end up with from that stf you'll note there are differences in color balance definitely i didn't edit this into the image i just think the filter is a bit narrower on the c star data right there um probably not that much in it but uh, enough to cause some color balance variations i reckon uh, but it's fair to say that in both cases if you move things along a couple more steps you know you can process a nice image from either these are now stretched data and also if you want that dwarf data to look a bit more red like the sea star stuff just on the left that's perfectly possible too it's just a case of uh, altering the color balance in the image but i think if i'm being you know honest with you the sea star data was a little bit more straightforward to process in order to come up with a nice looking color palette as i'm not that much of a fan of like the brown that came out of this data straight away so overall i have to say um usability wise both are perfectly fine um the dwarf as i said is, is improving massively over time the c star is a bit more simple to use and and more straightforward and if i was trying to set someone up on a given uh, a given night who was a beginner i'd feel much more confident that they could get themselves up and running and having some fun with the sea star than the dwarf but i think they could navigate the way through both that said uh the opportunity came to get one of these out again on another night and i actually ended up reaching for the sea star because it was just that bit more simple to get up and running and going and uh, i took a couple more test shots so here are those you know just uh, the cygnus wall right there about 55 minutes or something these were 60 second subs just in order to prove to myself that you can do 60 second subs with these things and uh, as you can see they actually look fine at this point if i just undo the process you can see a little bit of elongation right there but pointing angle seems to matter uh, based on the usability of those 60 second subs so that first region the state of butterfly that i was talking about i just could not manage 60 second subs from either telescope it wasn't working uh, but moving around the night sky other objects it was working so a bit of inconsistency to report to you there but uh, both of these you know it's worked really well there and you can see that if i take those c star data a little bit further you can process some quite nice images from very limited data sets this was about 45 minutes on the right this was about an hour or so on the left if memory is serving and uh, it was you know quite easy no uh, no stress whatsoever to gather these images anyway just a basic video like i said that's what it's been like for me to use these two smart telescopes at this point in time hope you've enjoyed Glitz guys